Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So um, um, our uh, our um, our subject of the day is basically the fourth station of attention. Um, just to remind ourselves where we got to yesterday, um, we said um, th there's a couple of rules that are true for any station of attention. The, the first is that there's kind of like the, there's there's what we would describe as the, as almost the apex of that station. So in the station of the outward, which is what we described yesterday, and you remember the outward is the station of the pre pre-adolescent child, the pre-teen, it's basically middle childhood. Um, that um, uh, that this, this pinnacle kind of, in a sense, almost describes the essence of the kinds of struggles that you have in that epoch of your life. Um, the, uh, the, it's pinned between two binary opposites. It's always you're kind of tussling two binary opposites uh, as you go through this epoch of your life. Um, uh, there's a conservative and a progressive drum. Um, in the case of the outward, which is the case of the prepubescent or middle childhood child, the, the, they pin between the distinction between the significant and the insignificant. And you remember that, that really the station is all about outward exploration. So your attention is really exploring, particularly the physical world out there. Um, it's, um, you know, kind of looking at, at, plants and trees and it's the greater external exploration um, uh, but as we move through this epoch of our lives we play this 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 um this drum of significance gets played more and more insistently in other words it's it uh, it, it sort of, it starts to predominate and this is in two senses we in the first instance we, do, we, we begin to understand what it means, what, what, what is significant. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the sort of the a child in, 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 in beyond middle childhood um, understands, for instance, what's important in a game, whereas a child before middle childhood is still just playing to participate. So there's a greater sense of, of what is important, what isn't important, and more importantly, who's important and who isn't important. So this is a growing kind of curiosity about competition um, and being the significant one. That pursuit of significance, of being the significant one, eventually uh, drops us or produces us into a kind of a state of disequilibrium. And like the boiled frog theory we spoke about, um, at some point, the frog is dead. So, so in a sense, you get flipped into a new station. That station we call the station of separation. This station is the station of adolescence. Now, <clears throat> we call it the station of separation because this is the time in our lives when we are most alienated. Uh, and in fact, alienating. They're both true. I mean, we... We want to stand out. We want to be important. We want to be significant. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, you'll, you'll notice this in your, with, with your own parenting, that you had this, this wonderful child. It was the sweetest character uh, until 12 years and 363 days. But on that, three, the, on that 13th birthday, a monster emerged from the room that they stayed in before. And you say, who, you know, who are you and, and what have you done with my child? Because this is a completely different creature. This um, sort of the accommodating sort of prepubescent child. This, and most, most prepubescent child, sort of children in middle childhood are very accommodating. I mean, they're very, they, they're, um, they're, they're not particularly rebellious. That gets replaced by... Uh, um, uh, sort of a competition junkie that had, turns everything into uh, a sort of a showdown. Everything is about win lose, and the issue is to become to come first. So that's why we call this station the station of separation, because the self is trying to individuate. The self is trying to separate, stand out in the world. 
stand above others, move out and beyond. And that's why it's also a very lonely place because unfortunately, the essence of all competition delivers you the opposite of what you want. I mean, I'm, I compete with you because I want you to admire me. But in order to, when I compete with you, in order for me to win, which is the thing that I want, you have to lose. Um, uh, so I want you to love me by making you lose. That's, uh, that's, that's rather um, not sensible. So it's a, it's a deeply miserable state in our lives. Um, this station of separation, you can also sense, in essence, is it would be exactly the opposite of a state of gatheredness. It is, if gatheredness is, is, is connection, separation is, is alienation. The, um, <clears throat> all of these states, uh, states uh, stations of attention, we know are pinned between two opposites, and they, it's the difference between the conservative and the progressive drum. Um, in the station of separation, the conservative drum is form, and the progressive drum is meaning. Now, what do we mean by this? The... In early adolescence, the adolescents real desire, although they express themselves as being deeply rebellious against their parents, the paradox to this is that they're actually enormously conservative in this period of their life. They want to fit in, but they don't want to fit in with their parents. They want to fit in with their kin group. And which is obviously a healthy thing because they are the next generation of, of people. So they do have to build a strong relationship with their kin group. Um, but uh, so, so this, this, this separation is about, is about distancing yourself from your parents, from your childhood, uh, be, uh, be connecting with your kin group. And, and what's very important is that it's a very conventional kind of outward sense of, of connection and identity. And I'll give you... Um, I'll give you a, a sort of quite an undignified example of this. Explain to me by what natural sense of fashionability it could be at all attractive for somebody to have their jeans halfway down their buttocks. How is this in any measure attractive or fashionable, or indeed even sexy. I find it deeply repulsive. And in, in the, it was about the mid 90s to the mid 2000s, this was how jeans were worn. It was actually considered to be the height of fashion. Hmm? Now you can't convince me that any sane thinking person would think that this is attractive, and yet you had a whole generation of people who seemed to agree it was attractive and actually emulated clothing like that to the point where fashion labels actually started to have a horror upon horrors. They actually started to cut jeans to look like that. They actually fitted the pockets halfway down the legs, and they cut the jeans so that it couldn't go up to your waist. It had to ride halfway down your bottom, and your, your, you know, half of you had to basically stick out. So... This, for me, is the most bizarre phenomenon. Now, it can only be that it was the fashion of that young generation of people that, that um, they all did it. So they all had to be fashionable. They all had to look like that. So it appears as if this station of attention is, a, is, a, <clears throat> is kind of like it's a rebellious station. But actually, initially, it's actually very conservative. It's about... It's all about form. It's all about appearances. And it's all about appearing to fit in to your, kin, to your, your peer group. Um, so, so, from the worst is this is kind of sort of early teens, 13 to maybe 16, where you have this, the most shocking things um, uh, kind of become acceptable and, uh, and sort of right because my mates are doing it. And, and if you're in a, in a country where there's a bit of a, um, a teen drug culture, this is, can be particularly scary for, for parents because they, you, know, you can really see, you get, sense you're losing your children. As the person moves through adolescence, you'll find that this, this, this 
rebellion becomes more and more thoughtful over a period of time. And so by the time the, the teen is 18, depending on the person, maybe 18 to 20, um, it's really about, I mean, th there's kind of like a deeper questioning of things going on. There's a search for meaning going on. Now, the, so, so a very good example of this is the, um, is the, uh, the, the 60s. The, so, so the post-war generation, the baby boomer, boomers, in other words, my generation, we hit our youth in the 60s and there were a lot of us because our parents who had fought the Second World War had seen a lot of killing and they'd obviously decided they had to replenish the human race. So there was quite a lot of breeding. So, I mean, so in the 60s, it was still not uncommon for a family to be, you know, I grew up in a family of six people and or six children. This was not uncommon at all. Um, so, so you had this big bubble of baby boomer generation kids hitting the world together, somewhat spoilt and indulged because that's one of the things that the parents did. They wanted to make sure that we never suffered like they did during the war. And, and so there was, a, there was a, so you could see in that generation, you could see almost a very explicit expression of what this adolescent worldview turns into. Now, what was interesting about that adolescent worldview is that it was, you know, why is it that, that so that the, you know, we, why is it that we grew our hair and put flowers in our ear and ears and kind of, you know, when put, you know, sort of in America, they put uh, uh, con uh, roses and the carnations in the gun barrels of, uh, of uh, army reserves and, you know, that sort of thing. Why did people do that? Why did they go to the Maharishi? I mean, you know, the Beatles did that. There was a whole generation of people went to India and got stoned. A lot of them got seriously sick and came back with malaria. Why did they do that? Because what they were saying to their parents is, I don't buy your, um, I don't buy your, your conventions. Your conventions are meaningless. They are all just about form. They're superficial. We want something of real depth. We want meaning. And that's really kind of the essence of what this period of latter adolescence and early adulthood is about. It's really about wanting something significant and meaning. Now, the meaningful, that can manifest itself in several ways. So it was, I think that the, the, the sort of the post-war baby boomer generation, that it was actually quite benign. I mean, the worst thing we did is smoked a bit of dope, but um, it can, subsequently, it, it can get quite distressing, particularly in Islamic societies, because this desire for meaning is also a desire for a better world. So these people become the foot soldiers of the, uh, of the environmental movement, of Islamic movements, of anything that provides a sort of a semi-millenarian intent to make the world a better place. Um, uh, is part of the search for meaning. It's wanting to make a grand uh, contribution. Now, this growth of um, a kind of a growing social conscience is also then something that prepares us for our adulthood because you adults need to have a social conscience. So this beating of the drum of meaning is the growing of a social conscience. It's also a, therefore a growing of an understanding of responsibility and one's own responsibility. And that in a sense prepares one for adulthood, middle adulthood, which is the next station, which is the, uh, the station of the significant, which is what we're going to speak about tomorrow. So, so the, um, this station of separation is the station of adolescence. It is between, it is, an, it is a, a, a movement of, uh, of, first of all, it is about extreme alienation. You're tussling two binary opposites in that period of your life. You're tussling with the issue of form and compliance to really wanting something meaningful. Um, that is also consistent with superficial and depth or um, uh, frivolous and form frivolous, see that are superficial, 
and they're responsible. Uh, you know, and that, that, that move towards away from form to responsibility to real meaning is the thing that then prepares us for this really, really distressing experience called adulthood, which is a, an unenviable um, experience that one can only weep in compassion for the poor souls that go into that part of their lives. Thank you very much, folks. That's it. Um, we'll see if there are any questions. Assalamu alaikum. The station of adolescence is almost synonymous with falling in love. Is that centered in rebellion, meaning, or form? Okay, so, um, uh, Zuhaib, I think the station of falling in love is actually true for the latter end uh, of that period of, of one's life. To, and so it is going towards meaning and away from form. Because it's so, so, you know, you could have the puppy love, but then there's that one connection maybe that happens in your late teens and so on that is the first real love of your life. And um, in, in, um, in some parts of the world, you end up marrying that person. You end up in a permanent relationship with that person. So, so that kind of, in a sense, is what hooks you into adulthood. Um, oh, Afia. <laughs> as a parent, how do I ensure my teen's autonomy as well as try to get some discipline without enforcing it? So, so here's my honest view of adolescence. And I must admit it's jaundiced. And I therefore um, completely uh, admit that you cannot trust the word that I'm about to say. I think these people should be locked up when they're 13 years old and should only be allowed out of the cage at the age of 21. These people have left the species. They're dangerous. I failed completely at parenting in this period, in this epoch of my kids' lives. And um, all that I can say is I don't think that there's a formula. And insofar as the state isn't going to relieve you of this horrendous burden of having these monsters in your home, I suggest the only thing you learn is some patience. I have no advice for you at all. Sorry. It's a pleasure, Afia. <laughs> Hmm. Lock them up off, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I think maybe on that very politically incorrect note, um, it looks like we're, we're done for the day. Um, uh, uh, you, you, uh, <laughs> uh, right. We are done halfway, and it occurred, occurred to me that we only traveled the adolescent much, and the rest of the half of the tension is left covered by 40 odd years. Uh, you see, as you go through, so, so I think most of our adult lives, at least. 15 to 20 years is spent in the significant, which is the next period, Ali. And then the other three stations are ones, also bear in mind that from, from this one forward, from separation forward, your own will becomes more and more of an issue. So I know lots of men at 40 who are still stuck in this period of separation. In other words, they still configure as adolescents. How do you know somebody configures that as an adolescent when, they, when, when, when uh, competition for them as a person will always trump collaboration? Where they always have to come first, they can never take the second place in the interests of the group. 
The person who's pursuing, who's in the significant, is really, they're trying to govern something bigger than just their own interests. So if you look at the corporate world, it's almost as if the corporate world focuses on people who actually operate as adolescents, operates in this extremely predatory kind of uh, uh, way of being in the world. So you can, you, you can, from this stage forward, your own volition becomes more and more of an issue and you really can get stuck. I know lots of people who are stuck in the station of separation. I work with high school teachers tasked with the responsibility of learning, developing character and worldview. Okay, so, so, so Zuhayb, what the thing the thing that moves young people out of the station of separation to significance to the significant is the development of a social conscience so um anything that you can do to get these people to take some responsibility of a part of the world that they're in is is immensely helpful so uh, to get, um, and we've actually have seen this. Um, one of our, our colleagues, Farouz Abrams, was involved in a city in South Africa called Port Elizabeth with uh, getting young people, for instance, to do things like to get involved with the um, with local old age homes and things like that. To get young people to, 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 to work on that energy, that, that pursuit of meaning by, by finding projects that will sort of turn them on it could be an environmental project it could be a, a social project and and actually it's useful if there's a little bit of risk involved so you know cleaning up a dangerous neighborhood or something like that and what's what what's what's a, a key to this thing also is that parents shouldn't be too concerned about the safety of the young people at this point in time because you know strangely enough mostly we do survive uh, and and you, you just create unnecessary um, uh, disturbance in the relationship if you if they want to go out and I don't know go and clean up the local creek and you nervous about the drug addicts there and whatever. All right, folks. Um, uh i think let's let's leave it at that um i didn't start off with any questions today i didn't get any for tomorrow um uh the uh, uh so the discussion for tomorrow depending on any questions we get in the in the intervening uh, uh, to this evening will really be the station of the significant the significant is the area where we spend most of our for most of us where we spend most of, most of our, our our adult life um, and maybe you can do a little bit of thinking about that. Um, so you can see what's been happening from, um, from the insignificant to separation is that there's been an increasing kind of dedication of attention into the world, into the outward, an exploration of the outward, a separating out, trying to kind of push into the world. Um, yeah, maybe you should consider what it would mean what, what are most adults trying to do, actually? Um, fantastic, folks. Have a wonderful evening. It's been nice chatting to all of you again. Um, all the best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.